Hey everybody, this is Adam Kokesh. Welcome to a special Adam vs. The Man interview with my friend, Joshua Smith. I'm honored to be joined by my friend today who's an at-large member of the Libertarian National Committee and a candidate for chair of the Libertarian National Committee. Warning, 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 you are about to consume biased media because that, that's how media works. And don't let the mainstream media lie to you unless they're covering someone with a video of their pants around the an their ankles. Yes, coverage equals support. I am covering Josh, Smith is, Josh Smith's role in this because I have endorsed him for chair, but also because I want to bring you the story of the 2020 National Convention, which is already, oh, oh, Josh, I'm, I'm glad we have the time. It, it is such a a strange, twisted saga already. And and I, I dare say we might only be halfway into it by a lot. I, we're going, okay, so for those of you who don't know, background on this, really important for anybody who's watching who's not super inside baseball with the Libertarian Party. We're going to explain why this is so critically important and why, as Libertarians, we're so concerned with the subversion of our party and our activism in general. The Libertarian National Convention happens every two years, and we elect national leadership and every four years nominate our presidential and vice presidential nominees. And right now, as a candidate myself for the Libertarian Party nomination for president, it is a very interesting process to follow as the coronaphobia epidemic. And Josh and I, we, we, we could just, we could do an hour telling our stories that we've had kind of overlapping through the course of this. Josh and I were at the Libertarian Party of Illinois State Convention, our last in-person one that we had in Peoria just Wow, Josh, doesn't it feel like years ago now? Yeah. When every day's worth of news is, is like a month's worth now? Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. So Peoria, Illinois was the last in-person state convention we had. And since then, things have been in, I think, extreme turmoil. It, it, it's fair to say with the Libertarian Party's plans for the national convention, with the debate back and forth on whether to do it online, in person, partially online. We saw all of this happening while Justin Amash, the first a formally, not first Libertarian in Congress, that was Dr. Paul, but the first formally affiliated member of Congress, Justin Amash, jumping into the race and jumping out very quickly. Looked like there was a lot of manipulation happening around that. And now it seems like after some seriously contented, contentious votes within the LNC, we are going forward with an online vote this Friday to determine who our nominees for president and vice president are. Although, based on the last test run of this conducted by Nick Sarwark, and I don't know how much uh, credit or blame our executive director, Dan Fishman, deserves for what happened yesterday. I, I know he's doing good work trying to keep up and make this happen, but uh, I saw... Our chairman, Nick Starwark, in a t-shirt, in his bedroom, failing to conduct an online meeting, let alone having a test run that would give us any kind of confidence in being able to hold an online vote or any kind of online business at this point. I was, I was incredibly disappointed. Joshua has come out and recently said he is no longer holding back. He is on the war path now more concerned finally finally josh more concerned with getting things done calling people out and protecting people's reputations i'm being a little facetious there but no to see that, that josh has moved past the time for diplomacy as we get to the final round of what counts going into this election in 2020 uh, it, it's great to see this contest open up uh, in every way in both the libertarian presidential race, your chair's race, everything with the LNC and the leadership of the party. Josh, uh, but before we jump into to you explaining the war path that you're on for people who are just learning about you for the first time, please give us the two minute intro, who you are and why you're running for chair. Sure, absolutely. So I'm a uh, Iraqi war veteran, much like yourself. Uh, different, different space. I was a Navy guy, but I was on the USS Constellation and 
Yeah, I was on the USS Constellation during Operation Iraq Freedom. In fact, the, the colony was uh, one of the biggest parts of the shock and awe campaign, if you're familiar with that. That was actually the, it, it was too long to call it the campaign to drop millions of tons of ordnance on Baghdad where families and children and dogs and stuff lived. So they just called it Operation Shock and Awe. Uh, so it was a big part of that. It really jaded, really jaded me on the military industrial complex. Um, I, and I got out in 2005 and, um, you know, I just didn't really fit with the Republicans anymore. They, they were pushing for war. The Democrats had signed on the war. Uh, I, I just didn't fit. And so I found Ron Paul, Dr. Paul in 2008. I think I found you around 2010. I know it's only te uh, Ted Glass. I also uh, was a big part of my, my, um, my foray into libertarianism and actually anti-statism -stat, uh, because he was the lead singer of the Misfits for a while. He was the lead singer of uh, Pennywise. He did an album with them. He had a band called Ignite. And I worked on a, I was actually in a musical with him called Quad by, by the Who. It was like a rock opera version of the Who's Quadrophenia. He was one of the main characters and he'd be backstage telling me about the horrors of central planning and state. And, uh, <laughs> I had no idea what the hell he was talking about, but it sounded great at the time, you know? And so I, I kind of found my way through them and then to uh, Rothbard and, and Hayek and all these great authors and economists. and. Um, you know, I, I joined the Libertarian Party first time in 2010, and I didn't find an a outlet for my activism almost at all. Uh, you know, I, I reached out to leadership, couldn't find anything that nobody ever gave me a campaign to work on or anything. So I just continued to do publication work and founded Think Liberty. And then 2016, I was like, there's no way I'm voting for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. It's just not going to happen. Uh, so I jumped on the, the Gary Johnson train. I, you know, I worked in his uh, campaign in 2016, Southern Washington. Uh, I joined the Libertarian Party of Washington there. I started working on uh, in Southern Washington as a, as a region rep. I was building affiliates there. And then sometime in 2017, I saw Nicholas Sarwar kind of taking a turn that I wasn't happy with. Uh, you could say, you know, this, this, these Twitter flame wars with prominent libertarians who could be helping us bring new members into the party, make new activists, make new candidates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just to be specific and name some names here. We're talking about the Tom Woods, Nick Sarwark, Twitter flare up. And Jeff, to and Jeff Dice and, and yeah. Jeff Dice and, and yeah. others who are who are of a slightly right leaning flavor of libertarianism. Right. And, and, sure. and I, I think. One of the great things I appreciate about you is seeing past that, but you, especially calling out other people when they fall into the left-right bickering in the libertarianism yeah. sphere that's aesthetics instead of ethics and really has no place here. Yeah, we don't. We, we we do so much arguing about an economic spectrum and where we where we stand that we forget uh, we're turning our swords inwards when we're we're up against two old parties that will napalm your children and not lose any sleep at night. So we need to stop fighting each other and realize we have better monsters to fight. And, and so that was kind of, you know, I, I, when I start, when, so in 2017, I called around a bunch of big name libertarians. I said, Hey, you're going to run for national chair. And every one of them said, ha, 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 you're crazy. Have a good day. You know? And so <laughs> uh, I just, I decided I'd put out an intent to run statement and see what happens. I had think Liberty at the time. We had about 11,000 followers, not anything huge. And, uh, so I put out my intent to run statement. I never thought that it would turn into what it was. I, I was on the road. I was on the road with you for two weeks. I went to 26 states. Uh, I, I keynoted behind Ron Paul at the Omaha Re uh, Roads to Freedom Unconvention. It was, it was you know, the time of my life. I got to meet libertarians all over the country. I got to go to a thing called Elf Fest. Uh, you know, it was it was kind of cool. Yeah, it was cool. So it was a good time. And um, yeah, yeah, you, you brought me up <laughs> and, and Marcus Polis. Uh, and so I... I um, you know, I lost. I took 22 and a half percent of the vote. I didn't do very good in the national debate. At the, it was my first live debate I had ever been in in my life. I was never a public speaker prior to this. You know, I started doing uh, Toastmasters since then, and I have started doing debate preps, and I have a debate coach, and I'm getting much better at what I do as far as my outward appearance with, with the party and my speaking. Well, well, and okay, my, okay, yeah, yeah, hold on. Josh, it's been, it's been awesome to be along this journey with you the last few years and see how you've come along. But I'm, I, I really need to reframe for you because I'm hearing just this little negativity and defeatism. No, you, you know, and, and I, I, I have to admit here that there was some, last minute manipulation around your vote total. I don't think you would have won the chair race anyway, but you genuinely had more support than your final number. And you should be really proud of this. Like you you ran for chair the first time, you parlayed it into an at-large seat on the LNC. Like, sure. and, and that's, 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 that's the 
that's the la the career ladder here. You know, you, you, and I've said this before. Uh, for, for there, you know, some people who are who have jumped into the chairs race to make a statement at the last second here, and it's like, no, if you, like, and there are people who, who went, when they saw this were like asking me to run for chair. And I was like, no, no, we, we have Josh Smith. I've endorsed Josh Smith. He's more qualified than me. Now, I will tell you, I would love to be chair of the party, and I might be running against you in two or four years. But until then, like, I'm not qualified. Nobody should be chair of the LNC without having been either a state chair or, uh, you know, at least done one successful term on the LNC. If you don't, if, if, if you don't have that experience, you, have, you don't have the institutional knowledge, you have no business you know, stepping into the race. You've done an amazing term on the LNC so far. You're the top recruiter. And, you know, you, you know you, you've done so much with this position already. And now I'm really grateful to have supported you last cycle so that we have people like you on the LNC to go on the warpath. So if there's nothing else in the introduction, please, what's the warpath, Mr. Smith? You know, I just, I've watched these petty backroom political games for, so, uh, you know, the entire term I've been on, on the, on the LNC. And, um, you know, I felt like I needed to protect people's reputations and this and that. And it, it came to a point where it's like, these same people who I'm protecting their reputations are actively working to see me fail, even if it's at the detriment of the party. Um, and, and I can give you a, an actual like instance that I'm talking about. I was made the chair of the affiliate support committee for the national party. Nick gave me that role. You know, it was a role where I get to handpick the, the committee and who's on the committee it has to be three members of the LNC and three members of the party some, somewhere else at large. And uh, I picked a great team of people. I mean, just, I would have failed if it had not been for them. Uh, you know, Aaron Adams, Richard Longstreth, Pat Ford, uh, David Demarest, Stephen Nicola, just John Phillips, great people. Yes, all of them. It was a great, all these cell phone numbers. the best committee I've ever been a part of. They're amazing. They have great ideas. We've been able to put some of those ideas into practice. We did the LP Everywhere uh, campaign that, that, that Aaron Adams that was her baby. It was beautiful. We gave $1,000 to LP Nova. They were the winner of that. But I found out that at the Reno LNC meeting, Nicholas Sarwark was walking with Aaron Adams, Richard Longstreth, and John Phillips Jr. and turned around to them and said, you guys should have let Joshua Smith fail. I put him in that position so that he could fail. Excuse me? That's horrible. This is the committee that backs up our affiliates. Right. This is the committee that finds creative ways to bolster our activism around the country. And he put me there so I can fail the affiliate, the affiliates. Now, let that sink in. What is that? We're playing these petty political backroom games in the Libertarian Party. We have 18,000 members. We're not the Democrats. We're not the Republicans. We have a an infrastructure to build. We need to grow our activism. We don't have time for these little petty, let's try to hurt somebody's reputation games, right? It's 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 insane. And then, you know, there's this, the fight for $75 an hour, if you follow that, Nick trying to yeah, push I did. a motion to pay himself $75 an hour. And now we're on this convention stuff and I'm watching the grossest display of corruption I've ever seen in this party. I mean, we're talking about you. There has been 20, no less than 20 tech proposals to do this thing the right way. They've all been poo-pooed on, all of them, to, to go with a platform Zoom that can only hold 1,000 members and let 1,000 members be active. We have 1,046 delegates. We have another 600-something alternates. So they have to put it into webinar mode. Webinar mode holds 3,000 people but doesn't give you an opportunity to make privileged motions or privileged points, right? So if the chair, who has unilaterally taken over this convention and not included the LNC in any of the planning, uh, if the chair does something bad or wrong and you put yourself in a queue to try and talk, it could be two hours before you even get a chance to raise a point of order. We will be way moved on by then. Votes will be done by then. You know, so so for me, I'm looking at it going, this is a really bad thing for our members. This is taking the rights of our members away. You know, I know that me pushing for an in-person convention, a lot of people are like, you're trying to skew the numbers and keep people from going. And I'm like, no, I'm trying to make sure that our members have the opportunity to ins in insert their voices into the national conversation because that's what they pay for. That's what members pay for. They pay to be a part of this process, and we're going to use a platform that keeps them from being a part of that process. 
Further, furthermore, there's all kinds of ballot access concerns should we choose our nominee online. We voted in the LNC meeting, a very long and arduous LNC meeting last weekend, that the internet is not a place. We, we, we pushed back on the chair, we overturned the ruling of the chair, and we said the internet is not a place. Our bylaws explicitly state that committee meetings can be done online, they can be done online, but we explicitly left national convention out of that language, uh, showing that we know what the internet is and we voted that it's not a place. And then we voted to still hold our presidential nomination online, meaning we are in direct violation of our bylaws. Any one of these challenge states can see that, go to their election office and say, these people did not nominate per the bylaws. We want to challenge them. Now, at the very least, they have the opportunity to wrap us up in so much litigation that extends past the November general election. We never get our candidate on the ballot there. And there's like something like close to 25 states where this can happen to happen in. The best part about it is I know for a fact there's states like Kentucky that this can happen in. They need a live in-person legal convention to get their candidate on the, on the ballot. And the, the other chair candidate, Joe Bishop Henchman, has called some of those states and said, look, we have something more important than ballot access. What's that? What is that? Oh, uh, we have to keep Joshua Smith and the Mises Caucus from taking over the party. Uh, <laughs> so now we're more worried about oh, new hold on, hold on, hold on. That's Hold on. That's, that's a serious. Hold on. That's, that's a, that, Josh, I, 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 to do my journalistic duty here, I have to. Yeah, sure. Stop you to, to go in on that. that that's a serious accusation. Serious You're saying accusation. that you have it. You have it in writing, or or, or at least a direct testimony from from state chairs that Joe Bishop Henchman is called, and Joe Bishop Henchman is another member of the Libertarian National Committee who is running against you. He's your main Correct. opponent for the chairmanship. Correct. And I have read direct te testimony <clears throat> from certain state chairs. Correct. Okay. That just that call has just, been just that call has that. been made. And he has said explicitly that ballot access is less important than making sure that I am not the chair of the Libertarian National Committee. Okay, so I... Ugh. It's a rough one, I'm, I know. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm tempted to sidebar here, but we're going to come back to Nick and, and Joe Bishop Henchman. Um, but let, just sticking to the narrative now, first of what's going on... Uh, this was a series of votes or the product of a series of votes by the LNC at virtual LNC meetings conducted by Zoom over the last couple of weeks. And at the last one, as you're describing, the vote was to determine that the Internet is not a place or that an online meeting cannot be a place for the, excuse me, for the purposes of holding a convention. But then it was decided that the chair would essentially be given special powers to host a kind of online convention to pick the nominee and it, and it remained vague as i understand from that motion how it would be conducted it, it, whether it would have to be ratified by a later in-person convention it seemed so it seemed to me that this being timed with a mosh jumping in and and what we know that uh, Nick has been courting Amash, encouraging him to run both publicly and privately. That he at some point he probably went to Amash and said, "Come on, come on, jump in the race. Uh, we'll make sure that you win. You know, we can control the process now, especially with coronaphobia." And then Amash jumps out because it looks like Nick is losing control. The meeting before that one, I was watching the entire thing because we thought that was the important one, and it was really. And and that you remember that one where where. The vote was nine to seven against Nick pushing for an all, all online convention. Sure. And he was told he wasn't allowed to vote. If he had been, it was he still would have lost nine to eight by one vote. And he he kept pushing for this. And it seems like he's been able to trick a number of people into thinking that we can do this hybrid convention this year where we do the nominations by this digital vote this weekend and then do all of the other party business at an in-person convention, possibly uh, two months from now. It, it, and first, I, I got to ask, is, is that, what, what is the status of the plan now for an in-person convention? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the in-person convention is scheduled uh, July 8th through the 12th at Rosen, Rosen Shingle Creek in Orlando, Florida. 
Uh, very, very nice resort, very, very big open space. We can comply with the six feet of social distancing and still have all our delegates there. Uh, there's plenty of rooms. There's a golf course if you want to go golfing. I mean, it's beautiful. Uh, so that as far as as far as everyone knows, that's planned. But Nick refuses to sign the contract because there's an opportunity for people to try and overturn this ruling and make it an all online convention this weekend. In my opinion, that's out of order, completely out of order. We've already deemed that the internet's not a place. We're already violating the bylaws by having an online convention. Um, but you know, I know that that's what has been pushed for. Nick has publicly shown that he's pushing to try and make this an all online convention. He's, I mean, we even found a poll where he voted yes on all online, uh, that he promises he will be fighting for an all online convention. Publicly, our chair, who's supposed to be this neutral moderator of the, of the party, is doing this. And so uh, it's it's really ugly. And, and, you know, some more backstory on this. After the after the meeting where we had the nine to seven vote for the in person, I could tell that they were going to keep pushing for this online, this all online convention. So I sat down and I, I worked out in my head and then called some friends, you know, Karen and Harlos and John Phillips and, and even Joe Bishop Hinchman. And I said, OK, look, here's a good compromise. Right. So I started putting together this compromise, writing out the whole language for it. The compromise was essentially to hold a preference, a preferential poll of the delegates. Who do they want to be the president and presidential nominee and the vice presidential nominee? That would need to then be ratified at the in-person convention uh, to do it legally. And so I started working out this compromise and I wanted this compromise to work for everybody. It was, you know, some people were still a little upset with this and that, but I hadn't put out the whole plan yet. I got Karen Ann Harlow's to sign on. I got Joe Bishop Henchman to sign on. All right, all right, hold on. I got I got got to ask you about the compromise now. Look, looking back on this, do you feel like you were suckered into giving ground to those pushing for online votes? Uh, to uh, yeah, yeah. And, I'll t and let me let me finish, and I'll tell you I'll tell you what happened, and you'll understand it a little better. So, so I get this this great proposal together, and uh, I put it on the list. Hey, I, I want I would like to have some time at the beginning of the next meeting to discuss this motion that I intend to make. These people have signed on. Uh, I have enough co-sponsors, and I set up a call with Joe Bishop Hinchman for that that Thursday before that meeting. And an hour before the phone call, Joe Bishop Hinchman sends me a message and cancels the phone call. Right? All right. All right. Well, I'm busy too. Let's reschedule. Never gets back to me. Right. So we go into this meeting. I've already given 48 hours notice on this position that I'd like to talk about. If you watch the beginning of that LNC meeting, that's what Karen Ann Harlos and Elizabeth Van Horn and Nick Lasarwark are all arguing about is that we had already put this thing on the list. We want to move it. But I had already called some of these members and said, look, I'm thinking about pulling out of this compromise. I can see they're going to try to use it as a tool to push for an all online convention. Um, that's not what this compromise is about. That's not the spirit of this compromise. The spirit of this compromise is to try and make life better for our, our, our membership around the country. Um, and so I'm thinking about pulling out. So I had already planned on not making this motion. And I had already told many of the co-sponsors that I had planned on not making this motion. Um, and, and you could see why I didn't make this motion because immediately following all, you know, the two hours of public comment, which has never happened in an LNC meeting before, uh, where we were all gaslit about why we should have an all online convention, uh, thanks to our chair, uh, Nick makes a motion to have an all online convention. We turned him down. Then Joe makes another motion that's an all online convention set out in two parts, <laughs> right? And I'm going, wait a minute. Do you guys see what's happening here? They're doing the same thing with different verbiage, right? And so then they start getting into these amendments and amending his plan. And I'm like, don't amend it. Don't amend it. Just vote against it. You know, and so they amended to have a second sitting where we're actually because they were trying to get into the spirit of some kind of compromise. And I understood what they were doing. But by the time we were at the end of that nine hour meeting, everyone was just so tired and beat down that they were like, all right, whatever, you know, fine, I'll vote for this. And that's what happened. You know, they worked everybody down. They kept them on the call as long as they could until it was late on the East Coast. You know, we're pushing it, was, it was it was it was what, nine Eleven. hours, 40 minutes, something yeah, like that. It's like a nine hour, a nine hour meeting online. And. You know, everyone's just done. And then Aaron Adams, bless her heart, tries to lob this one last Hail Mary in there and say, look, let's just do a preferential poll. We'll ratify it at the national convention. The LNC will be bound by the decision of the delegates. And she throws it in there. It gets voted down. And me, there's four people who voted yes on it. Me, Alicia Matson, Aaron Adams, and uh, was it Karen? I think Karen Ann Harlow's.
Okay, we're the only ones that voted yes on that proposal to try and make sure to save all the headache that you're seeing of this digital convention now. And so, and we've been lambasted for it repeatedly, you know, saying we were trying to take the 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 decision of the delegates away, and it's like, no, we're trying yeah, to get. So, so, so yeah, let, let, yeah, I want let, let me refocus just for a second to the the, the 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 way I see this bigger sequence of events happening. Because if the party leadership decided, hey guys, we need to nominate our our candidates, and you know, we really can't wait strategically. This is what we've decided on. So here's how we're going to do it. They wouldn't be trying to have an online convention or even an online vote. They would do it by email. They would have the chairs. They say, look, this week, like, and here just off the top of my head, even, you know, one way, and, and uh, yeah, we've considered versions of this idea before, that, that, that we could just, you could have the vote one day at a time forever, you know, each, each round of the voting one day, each day of that week, the chairs have to, you know, tabulate their vote among their delegates and then the state chairs send it to national you get rid of the secret ballot it's all transparent all by name and you could do this and you could have a binding transparent process where we go yeah can't argue with that but what they're proposing now is everybody sits in front of their computers and goes i'm voting for kokesh or hornberger or mons or jorgensen or whomever and then the screen pops out a mosh you know of course it's not a mosh now it's whoever the uh, whoever I guess among us as, as presidential candidates is is best able to bribe Nick. I I don't is it, I I'm like I, I don't know where this is going. I don't know. I, I know there's like I said the so, Ellen's been completely cut out of it, man. We've been completely so so what's so procedurally what scares me here is that what happened was because of the coronaphobia crisis. The LNC was scared and in some ways bullied into canceling the convention. And what I said from the beginning was that we should not cancel it. We need to do it uh, on the date as close to as planned as possible. If it means we have to go outside of Austin city limits, we go to a different venue, we go to whatever, but it has to happen in person at this time. If it doesn't, we're going to be screwed in so many ways. And I hate to say, I told you so, but everything I'm seeing is, 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 or I saw is unfolding now because now it's going to be very easy. And I've been thinking about this is can you obstruct this pro- as someone who doesn't want a, 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 a cheated online anything to happen right now? Could you obstruct this? Could a, could a hacker get in? Uh, and, 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 and in my case, I would say it would be a white hat hacker, but could a black hat hacker who just wants to spoil the process for whatever reason prevent this from happening? Could someone? even uh, involved in this online process because Nick is uh, trying to make it look like a convention where he has to include other people as opposed to, hey, I'm the chair, state chairs, come give me your votes and we're going to add them up and publish them. And therefore, he now is in a position where what he's trying might be just logistically impossible, not just in the process, and, and I don't want to, like, demean our capability. We are more than capable of doing all of this online, but to create the procedure and the process that has the institutional buy-in, that has the people around it knowing what to do, not just the tech. They, I mean, but they're, they're showing they can't even do the technical side. I didn't know until you pointed out, though, that they've gotten 20 other proposals from tech-savvy LNC or, or LP members. Not surprising. We have plenty of ways to do this. But here's my bigger fear, Josh, and, and, and tell me how you see where, where this is going, is that now, once we have given up the date for an in-person convention of Memorial Day weekend, as, as we had originally laid out, it means that both things can be obstructed. And we have a chair who seems committed to obstructing the in-person convention from happening by not signing the contract, at least. And we have people on on the right to side of things saying, well, we can obstruct an online vote. We can hack it. We can. I mean, even for me, I was trying to get on the test run yesterday, tried to sign in and it didn't let me. Uh, it said my email and password were invalid. I logged. I tried a couple more times. We tried, typed it out right. Now I'm locked out from multiple login attempts. Oh, well, I guess I'm not a delegate anymore. Like, re- like, really? But, you know, so what do you think? now is going to happen this weekend is nick even going to be pull off going to be able to pull off any kind of online vote 
that gives the members any kind of confidence in the outcome. Well, I think the, I think the word of the day is corruption, uh, Adam. And, and we're, you know, this, this whole process is fraught with technical corruption, human corruption. I mean, it's, it's fraught with it already. You can see what's going on. I think, I don't think, I think that this presidential nomination, no matter how we conduct it online, is going to have an asterisk next to it in the LP history books for the, the rest of time, because half of this party, a minimum of half of this party, is not going to have faith in the outcome of this election. They're just not going to. Well, if it happens this way. So like, I, I just want to point out, for people that don't know, that when we talk about the in-person convention, the significance of this for the party, for the nomination, is especially when we come in with a fractured party, we come in with people uh, backing different presidential candidates, we have an open, transparent process right there where you can look people in the eye who disagree with you and say, okay, well, there's more of you than there are of me. We're going to get behind the majority and, and pull together and support this nominee. With an online vote, uh, it's, it's not going to happen that way. And it could, but there's no push for, there's no, it's, it's like, is there a backup plan? Uh, is something along the lines of what I described, is it possible at the last minute Nix comes out and says, you know what, guys, you know, I'm really sorry that we try to do it this way. Uh, is it possible that That's he gets on? Is it possible that, <laughs> that, that, no, 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 hold on, let me finish. Cause is it possible that he gets online on Friday, May 22nd, as scheduled and says, hey, guys, I, this is Nicholas Sarwar, chair of the LNC, with the power vested in me by the vote of the LNC. I, I'm, I'm calling to order not a convention, but a special meeting of the delegates to our national convention this year to de determine who our nominees are. Here's how we're going to do it. We now have a fair, transparent process. It's going to be slow. You're going you're gonna to vote one at a time by your state chair. I mean, to me, this seems like the only way he could actually pull it off and saying, look, you know, I'm not going to try to do this live. We're not going to try to do this as a convention style um, you know, gathering at a virtual place. We are going to hold a vote and do the best that we can to make sure that it follows the bylaws procedures, that it, it, it looks like the vote process of, of multiple round balloting that we would have at the national convention. We're going to do, you know, one ballot per day. Uh, I mean, he could still do that, right? Is that is that why is that not a realistic possibility? Sure would be you nice. Trust, you know, you know, sure would be you know, nice. So, wouldn't it? so you don't think you don't trust him to do the right thing at the last minute in that sense? No. That would that it, for it, and he's done so many wrong things that it, you know it, it wouldn't save him, so to speak. But to do the right thing in this circuit that would be the right thing in the circumstance for him. Yeah, sure. I, mean, I, I, I agree that. that I, we can agree that that would be the right thing, Adam. <laughs> okay. So uh, what? What? So predictions. What do you think is actually going to happen? Why is that not likely? I, I'll, I'll be shocked if we can get through this process that they have laid out by the end of Sunday night. Just to be honest with you, I'll be very shocked. And um, you know, even the, the the Kentucky poll that was held after the last debate went thirteen rounds. You know, uh, and with the mosh out, I'm sure that we could look we can look forward to more rounds than thirteen. Maybe you never know. And so well, speaking of that, the, the, the last I've heard with this is that even even with that, the, the numbers that they published originally had me at 18.44 percent with 356 votes. And then there's 536 votes and all of a sudden I'm down to 7 percent. That's actually mathematically impossible. So yeah, I, don't some, know. Some I don't know how they did all that stuff, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I, and I, saying, think, I think that first number is accurate. I think, you know, and anyway, I, 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 well, if you want to ask me questions, we can do that too, but go ahead. It's going to, it's going to be a mess. And, and the, the tests have shown that it's a mess. And, and the, the, the sad part is I watch a lot of the delegates on my, on my, on my Facebook feed, right? There's tons of delegates who are like, oh, I love this process. It's so great. It's so easy. I'm, I'm happy that we're doing it this way. And then there's 50% of the other delegates are like, I couldn't even in. I couldn't make a privilege motion. I couldn't do this. And I'm like, the people who are getting in and are able to do this correctly are completely disregarding that there's a whole other side of this where people are not able to be a part of this, are not able to use their voice to, to raise a point of order. And, and they're upset. But because you got in and you were okay, you're disregarding all the other members who were not able to get in. And I'll tell you, yeah. of the three tests that I've known about, Two of them I have not been able to get into, and I'm on the LNC, and I even switched my email address for this last one and still couldn't get it. So it's not just normal people, man. There's 
candidates that can't get in. There's LNC members that can't get in and can't do this correctly. There's delegates. There's alternates. It's a big deal that we – look, if all 1,046 of those delegates want to be there on that call and 100 of them can't get in, can't be a part of the process, can't raise a point of order, this is a corrupt system that we should not be attached to, period, plain and simple. Every delegate that wants to have their voice heard should have the opportunity to do that. And you are effectively shutting down their voice. Yeah. So this is, of course, raising a bigger carrier possibility, which is that there would be some vote declared as proper by the chair and that the majority of the delegates in the base of the party would reject it and say no. And, and, and that this would cause the great civil war of the libertarian party of 2020 and uh, you know i mean i i just i'm i'm laughing to my at my silly title there but yeah that 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 would be uh the situation we have walking into an in-person national convention later this year which seems unavoidable at this point um i i want to turn for a second to uh nicholas star mark himself personally here and i have to start with a caveat that's very important and not condemning any individuals based on anything and i do i i am extremely aware of the manipulations that any activist can be subjected to and if you're the chairman of the libertarian national committee and you are leading the charge in that capacity for the libertarian movement against the duopoly of two old parties that have multi-hundred million dollar annual budgets who have plenty of room for black ops, for bribes, for threats, for all sorts of other manipulation. And we know that COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program of the FBI to mess with activists is alive and well in new and different formats with infiltrators and saboteurs all around us. So when we look at the behavior of someone like Nick Sarwark, it's kind of like, is he an infiltrator or not? Is he a saboteur or not? Almost, it doesn't matter. If it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. But is he an agent? Is, is, is he someone who's motivated by evil? Or is he a pawn in all of this? And, and I want to be very cautious in coming from a place of love to make sure that we give every person who faces any kind of accusation the benefit of the doubt and the possibility uh, needs to be considered that they might not be acting by their own free will, that they are certainly prone to threats and manipulations. And I would tell you, Josh, if uh, if someone comes and says, we're going to kill your family if you don't tell the world that, that Adam Kokesh is an evil asshole, then, you know, tell the world. Tell the world, Josh. Save your family. And, you know, and I, would say, I would say the same thing to, to Mr. Starwark and, and give him that same benefit of the doubt. That being said, it looks like, uh, either he is subject to some gross, significant manipulation of that sort, or he's just not here for the right reasons. And and you lumped in Joe Bishop Henchman uh, in, in your accusations here today about essentially not being involved for the right reasons. And I think that's really the, the, the critical demarcation. And I, and I want to go back to the point that you made about Joe when you when you said that he was willing to say that there's something bigger than ballot access, and that's defeating Josh and the Mises caucus. And it, it, it is really sad, but that is the clear revelation that his motivation is not pure, that he would rather the part, he would rather be in charge of a weak party than be on the board of a strong party. He wants what's better for himself and is willing to put that at the expense of the movement. Now, I can say, I want what's best for myself. I have rational self-interest, yeah, but I am connected enough with the bigger vision that I put the cause and the party above my immediate personal self-interest because my greater self-interest is a world set free in our lifetime. I am playing the long game. I want the world for my children where they get to grow up on the other side of statism. And when you see people seemingly making these bad decisions for short-term or personal interests, they deserve to be called out. And it is worth, as you have in the past in many situations, protecting people's reputations for the sake of the movement, for the sake of the party. Like, do we need to point out the, every little personality flaw of everybody on the LNC every day? No, of course not. 
But when it comes to things that rise to the level as they do now of affecting our nomination and the future of the party and the movement, nobody's reputation deserves to be spared. So, Josh, your analysis on on what I just said, the motivations, what do you see happening here with uh, with Sarwark himself personally, with uh, Joe Bishop Henchman just angling for the chair's position? And if, if you care to weigh in also, I would ask you to... to uh, consider the recent statements of your fellow uh, committee member, John Phillips, who has uh, also seemed to have joined you on the warpath. Yeah, there's several people and there's still people to come. You know, there's there's a lot of other people who I mean, we've heard we've heard uh, accusations of, of direct threats over the phone uh, from our chair. If, if they didn't go along to get along with this this online process. Uh, there's a lot of stuff and there's a lot of people that have yet to come forward that may still come forward. I mean, there's I, state chairs that I know of, like I said, that have had these phone calls with Joe Bishop Henchman. There's uh, members of the, com the Convention Oversight Committee who have come forward and said some stuff and are probably going to say a lot more stuff. And uh, it's it's yeah. motivated by this small pond politics, right? We're in this tiny pond. The Libertarian Party is a small pond that is inching its way towards the ocean, trying to fight these behemoths. And when you get in that small pond, everybody's got this huge voice, right? Because there's there's only 18,000 of us. And so the, the, everyone's got this huge voice. So people start getting kind of drunk with this lust for power of this tiny pond. And it's like, what does that matter? Why does that matter? That's not what matters. What matters is that we're making policy changes. We're moving the Overton window in the United States. We're getting farther away from the warfare state. We're getting farther away from uh, the, the drug war. And, and But they, get, they just get entrenched in this small town party politics shit that they believe that they have to have all the power. And it's like a guy like me comes in that's growing the pond. We're making the pond bigger. And, and I have committed to making the pond the biggest pond in this, uni in this United States. And they see that I'm effective at doing this and it's taking their voice away. The bigger the pond gets, the smaller the fish get, right? And so it's a worrisome to people. They feel like they're not gonna have power anymore over the direction of the party and because new people are coming in. We have to bring new people in. We cannot be a successful political organization if we are not bringing new people to our ideals, to our candidates, and to our mission. And so they've tried to kill me in the past, right? Not just, we're talking uh, philosoph philosophically <laughs> and politically, right? They've tried to kill me in the past. They, they tried to kill me in 2018. They walked away, you know, with their thumbs in the air, in the air thinking they had, they had me beat. I came back <laughs> like, like a damn zombie. And, uh, and I think that they're just worried that I'm not going to go away. And they're right. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here to stay. I'm here to fight for this party. I'm here to fight for libertarian ideals in the United States. And unless they actually kill me, I'm not going anywhere. Well, I, I certainly share the sentiment. It's an honor to be standing alongside you in this, Josh. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'd like to think that if I was in your position on the LNC, I might have seen this uh, manipulation coming one step sooner than you did, but you saw it, you responded appropriately. I am all the more confident in my endorsement of you for chair of the LNC this year. And to see how you've conducted yourself in this, and, you know, is, is really, I think, uh, you know, what the party deserves. Of course, you know, when I, when I look at Nick's chairmanship over the last three terms now, the, the biggest disappointment, and, and I think, you know, the, the, this in and of itself, uh, and, and, you know, party historians might might contest me on this and say, no, look at other chairs. They haven't been media figures or, or, or you know, banner carriers for the party at all. But, you know, I look back at the last six years with Nick as chair and I think what a wasted opportunity, you know, and he's not bad. I, I, I've seen some of his, his mainstream media appearances. There have been, oh, well, there have only been a few uh, over the last six years. And he's, he's good. Like he, he presents well. He, he's articulate. But uh, to think that whoever our chair is could be getting out talking to people every single day representing the party hustling doing podcasts interviews all that thing you know all of that which you can do with the chair's title to spread the message and grow the party you know what what a wasted opportunity how much further along could we be right now if you had been in the chair for the last six years although i don't think you were ready you're ready oh, now i was this last this ready. last test this last test certainly has given me all the more confidence in your ability to to resist this kind of manipulation as chair. So 
Uh, I'll just I'll just give it to you to to wrap this up, Mr. Smith. Any last thoughts before we uh, before we sign off? I just uh, I want everybody in this party to understand that that my motivations for what I've done over the last two weeks are 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 for your own rights, your rights, not protection, not not not. You know, I'm what I'm doing is because I want to see the members' rights respected in this party. We're a party that is built around getting our rights back in this country. We should be expecting the same in our own party. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that you guys will see that I stood on principle through this, regardless of if you're going to vote for me for chair or not. Uh, and, and I tried to do the right thing, and, and I'm always going to try to do the right thing for this party. So hopefully I, I've earned your support. If not, please reach out to me. I'm always available. I have an open-door policy for any member of this party who has concerns that they want to talk about. All right. Thank you so much, Joshua. And to everybody watching this video, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or anywhere else, remember, we require an active and engaged audience to succeed as independent media. So share this video, especially this one in particular. Share it around libertarian circles. Share it with people who are delegates who might not have the luxury that you do of paying attention to all this inside baseball stuff, because right now it really is important. Thank you so much for joining us today. Mwah. Peace and love, y'all.